Welcome, I'm Paul Salem from the Middle East Institute, and uh, we are here with another episode of Vantage Point, our video webcast, and I'm very happy to have with me our colleague at the Middle East Institute, Dr. Gunul Tol. Gunul, welcome. Thank you. Gunul is the founding director of MEI's uh, Turkish uh, Studies Center. Uh, she works and writes uh, extensively on uh, Turkish affairs, both uh, domestic affairs and, and foreign policy. She's also an adjunct professor at George Washington University's Institute for Middle East Studies. Uh, we're talking today about the potentially transformative event of uh, the last few days, which was the referendum in Turkey. Uh, let's start first with what actually happened. Uh, there's controversy about the results and maybe mm -hmm. start there before assessing its broader impact. Well, the government captured a razor-thin majority um, and there were serious concerns about foul play because the electoral board made a last-minute decision on the day of the, the, the referendum. Uh, so the opposition is arguing that there are about 2.5 million votes um, some are missing, some are in the Kurdish area, and as you know, there is a state of emergency, so the vote mm -hmm. was held under a state of emergency. Uh, and there are hundreds of thousands of displaced people, especially in, in the Kurdish region. So all these problems, they call into question the legitimacy of, uh, mm -hmm. and also the, the thin margin calls into question uh, the legitimacy. Does it matter, first of all, procedurally, in other words, is there will there be any recounting or any procedure to address that? Mm -hmm. And the second part, would it matter politically that it was razor thin? Well, unfortunately, uh, so according to the procedure, the electoral board itself, uh, the very institution that made the mistake in the first place, will uh, make the final decision. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think it's, it's going to be resolved. Um, uh, and, and, and politically, um, even hours after the, the opposition declared that they would ask for a recount. And in 2014, when a similar incident happened and when the ruling party demanded a recount, um, that happened. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's going to happen right now because only a few hours after, um, after the debate started, uh, Prime Minister and Turkish President announced uh, their victory. Uh, so I think uh, nothing is going to change, mm -hmm. but that really that will create further further chaos and instability because people are on the street. They're uh, they're very unhappy with uh, with not only with the result but with the way the referendum was was conducted. Well, that's interesting. I mean, if you look at U.S. elections, the election in 2000 was more than razor thin between George W. Bush and Al Gore. The last election in the U.S. Hillary Clinton won the popular mm -hmm. vote and all that happened. So there's a lot of controversy. The country is split in a way similar to the country being split in Turkey. Uh, and in the U.S. that led to a, you know, certain presidencies that took certain, certain policies and positions and made a big difference. But in Turkey, some are saying it's even more profound than that. This is a, you know, it's a, it's a ref referendum over the change of a constitution, mm -hmm. not the confirmation of a president or just the reinforcing of a president. Mm -hmm. So how profound is this shift uh, in Turkey if it goes forward? I think I, I would argue that this is the most important political development since the inception of the Republic in 1923. Oh. So and especially that's that's why it's so problematic. Sunday's vote is so problematic because clearly when you are carrying out such a huge fundamental structural uh, change, reform, you really need a national consensus. Uh, you need more than 1%. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that hasn't happened. Uh, so that's why it, it, it's very problematic because uh, half of the country is opposed to the change. And yet they feel like they, they feel they've been marginalized under the ruling party. But with, this, with the referendum, this is not just a regular election where you pick a government for the next four years. Well, help people understand why is it so profound? Some of the media coverage has been saying, well, it, it strengthens the president. Mm -hmm. And many people see that as kind of, you know, okay, it's a strong president. But others have explained it as really undoing what uh, was done in the mm -hmm. foundation of the Turkish Republic, which was very parliamentary. The government was mm -hmm. members of parliament. There was a lot of checks and balances. How would you, do, how would you simplify the changes that seem to have been approved uh, this Sunday? This is a major, this is a shift from a parliamentary system to a presidential system. 
So under the parliamentary system, you have a, a president with symbolic powers. But that changed in 2014 when Erdogan was popularly elected as the president of the country. And since then, we have a de facto situation where President Erdogan, unconstitutionally, according to the constitution, he has to be above politics. And yet he is uh, very close to his party and he was not he didn't play that neutral role that he was mm -hmm. supposed to play according to the constitution. So uh, there is a de facto situation and with Sunday's vote, uh, maybe in practice we won't see um, a difference, but this is changing the institutions and this is changing the constitution. So under the new in the new system, uh, the president will pick uh, the ministers he will not need a uh, vote of confidence from the parliament. So mm -hmm. the parliament will almost be sidelined. Um, he will pick senior bureaucrats. He will pick uh, top officials Without in the military. Very checks little, and balances no, or oversight? No, no and checks and balances. Mm -hmm. A very li little uh, legal oversight. And he will also appoint the majority of judges mm -hmm. uh, in t uh, top Turkish courts. So this is quite problematic. Uh, so if, especially if his party, and also he will become the, the head of his uh, party, especially if his party captures a majority in the parliament, then there will be no checks and balances whatsoever. So mm -hmm. this is a major change. Mm -hmm. And those checks and balances previously in, in the Turkish system, certainly mm -hmm. the parliament or the elected parliament, the judiciary, mm -hmm. and one might even say in a maybe negative way, the military itself. Mm -hmm. And some of the uh, articles of this referendum also further sideline or weaken the military as an institution. Would you say that's mm -hmm. an accurate? Yes. Yes, I agree. I mean, uh, aside from the military, I think, it, I mean, it's uh, of course no secret that Turkey has descended into authoritarianism in the last few years. And uh, there is no media freedom. Uh, Erdogan and his party, they control uh, media, they control business community. Um, and there have been very few checks and balances anyway. Mm -hmm. So in such a context, the parliament remained the only place where uh, we could hear some criticism of, of the government. Mm -hmm. And now with the, the referendum result, we won't even see that because even the parliament will, will be sidelined. Uh, so, and, and also the, the military, I mean, especially after the, uh, the military has been sidelined, had been sidelined already, um, and, uh, there were in, since 2010 there were uh, court cases against the military mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the military had been marginalized yeah. but especially with the, the failed coup of July 15th uh, things changed more dramatically mm -hmm. for the military and with the new the, the approved constitution uh, it will be sidelined mm -hmm. further. Well, let's uh, look into those who supported the referendum and mm -hmm. the changes uh, uh, what do you think they were voting for? What are they afraid of? What are they hopeful will happen in the Turkey that they seem to have voted for? Well, I was yesterday I was watching an NPR documentary on this, and it just captured uh, the, the the mood, especially mm -hmm. within the the yes camp that supported the amendments. So they were talking to uh, a supporter of Erdogan, uh, a young uh, woman, and she said, "Well, I voted yes, um, and I." I don't have any idea about the content of the referendum mm -hmm. package, but this is the, the guy that I support and I, and I voted for him. Mm -hmm. So I think this captures the mood within the yes camp. And of course, there is no need to explain um, the mood in, in the opposition. They feel that this is going to turn Turkey into a one man, uh, a, a party state in mm -hmm. a way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's why they've been object uh, objecting to um, the, the changes, the amendments, but also within the AKP's own base. And we've seen that on, on Sunday because Erdogan lost major cities like Istanbul, and Istanbul is a very important town. Sure. He launched his political career in Istanbul, and he hasn't lost a vote since 1994. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that he lost Istanbul is very te telling and indicates that He's lo he has lost ground among his own within his own constituency. So there are people, especially middle class, urban, educated, AKP supporters, who are um, skeptical about his authoritarian agenda. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, if we took this in a broader context historically, 
Najm al-Din Arbakan, who was mm -hmm. prime minister of sort of the Islamist movement back in the late 60s, also sort of had a similar uh, orientation. But this, I want to link it to Turkey's positioning vis-a-vis -vis the West or mm -hmm. its Islamic Ottoman past. And there was sort of a tendency under Erbakan to go back to the old view of mm -hmm. not so much a Western secular country. But uh, Erdogan and Abdullah Gul broke from that and initially rose to power and, you know, looking westward and so on. Uh, would you say that this kind of closes that chapter and, and, and that Erdogan with these reforms and maybe with developments, you know, these with Europe and, mm -hmm. and elsewhere, uh, as some people have said, is seeing himself as a, you know, going back as a sultan, as it mm -hmm. was, uh, uh, and harking back to the Ottoman model where Turkey was an Asian, you know, Islamic state and had a huge leadership role there and through that had a leadership or place at the table globally. Mm -hmm. So in that big historical picture, is Erdogan just sort of an authoritarian who wants more power or mm -hmm. he has some broader historical vision. Grand vision. I think he's different than Arbakan. Mm. And I see him less of an Islamist than Arbakan. I mean, Arbakan was very ideological and a, and a true Islamist. Mm -hmm. I, I think Erdogan is different. And, and we've seen that since he came to power, I mean, he ran on a very center-right, conservative center-right agenda, uh, conservative uh, agenda. And yet, um, his term in power really did, hasn't translate into an Islamist agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, he became an authoritarian. And that's what many in Turkey uh, and in the West are concerned about. So mm -hmm. it's less of in the 1990s where um, Erbakan was uh, the prime minister briefly in 1995. Um, people were more concerned about Islamism. Mm -hmm. But right now, I think the story of Turkey is different. So it's not um, Islamism versus secularism anymore. Uh, it's become something else. Mm -hmm. So it's pure, it's pure uh, authoritarianism, mm -hmm. and this is different. Maybe so, similar to the Russian model or the Egyptian uh, model. Or e exactly. Like yeah. So it is. It's really this is not Islamism and and uh, this this dichotomy between um, Islamism versus Kemalism, Islamism versus secularism doesn't capture the reality, mm -hmm. because since he came to power. Yes, he's been trying to raise a pious generation, and, and I think he's carried out uh, policies that would really um, create a, a, a religious generation. But in terms of is Islamizing the state, he hasn't done anything. Uh, so, so this goes to the heart of uh, Turkey's main problem, which is, I think, Turkish society is in inherently there's something authoritarian mm -hmm. about Turkish society and I think that goes back to the the statist ideology that ideology of worshiping the state mm -hmm. uh, and also the loss of bourgeoisie in a sense starting from the 19th century so everything was done by the state even economic development uh, so even the bourgeoisie was uh, a tool mm -hmm. a creation of the state so that's why people ask me you have such a huge middle class in Turkey and how come they're still mm -hmm. voting for an authoritarian leader because you would expect the opposite and that hasn't happened so I think this answers the question yeah. uh, and and so that's why uh, I think this is Turkey is living in a post Kemalist and post Islamist era mm -hmm. but unfortunately one would expect um, liberalism to flourish in that era and that hasn't happened and mm -hmm. that has something mm -hmm. to do with the political uh, culture. Let's look a bit at what it, impact it might have on some key issues for Turkey, particularly the Kurdish issue, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is, has been one of the biggest. And while we're talking about that, perhaps policy uh, on the hot issues of Syria, PKK, northern mm -hmm. Syria, and so on. Other than the domestic issues of economics, maybe just sticking mm -hmm. to those two issues, how do you see risks and opportunities? I'm, I'm a bit optimistic uh, mm -hmm. about Sunday's um, results, because if he won a landslide victory, he would have certainly doubled down mm -hmm. uh, and continued with his uh, very anti-Western nationalistic policies. And if he lost, uh, again, there's already a de facto situation where he's, he's already very powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, we would see more of that. Um, but, but now the fact that he won by a slim majority, I think that it will have a moderating effect on his strategy. 
um, because one of the interesting results of Sunday's vote was that he um, got the backing of, of a very surprising constituency mm -hmm. because his election strategy was trying to woo the nationalist vote, galvanize Turkish nationalists. So he has used a very nationalist rhetoric. And, and, yet and by nationalist, it's a lot of it is anti-Kurdish. Right? And anti-Kurdish, right? yeah. exactly. So uh, one would not expect uh, him to increase his votes uh, among the Kurds. And yet mm. that's exactly what happened mm. among uh, conservative Kurds. And of course, there are other reasons for that, why Kurds turn to, some Kurds turn to, to Erdogan uh, again in this context. Um, but especially in his speech, victory speech, he underlined that fact, saying that um, we realize that we increase our, our votes among, um, among the Kurds. So I hope that um, this thin uh, majority, as well as the, the support that he received from, from the Kurds, would um, change his strategy. and. To, we have uh, presidential elections in 2019, so to ensure a more comfortable win, he might go back to the negotiations with the uh -huh. Kurds to, to keep that Kurdish support. Which and then that, might influence northern Syria or policy yes. in northern Syria, and, possibly. And also yeah. Turkey's relations with the U.S. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, because well, let me end with, mm -hmm. I mean, given our, you know, short of time, uh, end with two questions. One is uh, how you see EU EU-Turkish relations mm -hmm. in the coming year, let's mm -hmm. say, after the referendum, and U.S.-Turkish uh, relations, mm -hmm. what impacts might it have? Um, well, there's been a lot of tension, uh, especially between Turkey and the European Union, <clears throat> and I, I would argue that some of it is, is structural, uh, emanating from problems on the European side. Uh, they're dealing with their own Muslim immigrant mm -hmm. population. And uh, there are elections going on in Europe, so they really have to uh, have to play that populist card themselves. And for Erdogan, he played his own populist card. Uh, so having that, that very anti-EU rhetoric, I think, uh, helped him on Sunday, so he could be able to galvanize, mobilize the nationalists, according to recent public opinion polls. So that was a nice strategy for him. But I don't think in the long run that is sustainable, because yes, yesterday I was, um, I was listening to one AKP official saying that European Union is very important for us, because it's the, the most important trading partner for Turkey. So at the end of the day, this might have been a wise move on the eve of the referendum for Erdogan, but I think in the long run he really has to ease the tension. But of course the question becomes, what about the European Union? Mm -hmm. Because uh, how will the, the EU deal with a Turkey that has officially become authoritarian, a te mm -hmm. textbook authoritarian country? Um, so uh, I see more problems moving forward. With the US, <clears throat> I think the problems were real. In bilateral relations, Turkey had concerns about uh, the US PYD cooperation and also the extradition of Fethullah Gülen. Um, again, if Erdogan decides to move forward uh, with the, the Kurdish uh, opening peace process domestically, <clears throat> I think that will remove some of the tension in Turkey-US uh, relations. Uh, and that will give, uh, make more room to maneuver for mm -hmm. Turkey in mm -hmm. Syria. Um, but I think on the Gulen question, the problems will remain because that's, that's, uh, that involves a legal process and I don't think the Trump administration can intervene in that process. So it will take years and um, it, I see it highly unlikely for the U.S. to hand Gulen over to Turkey mm -hmm. and that will uh, create uh, problems mm -hmm. in bilateral relations. Uh, let's end with uh, what do you think the U.S., I mean in terms of a policy issue towards Turkey, as relates to this this great change, you mentioned that for the EU, there's the mm -hmm. issue of you know Turkey becoming, as you said, officially an authoritarian system. Mm -hmm. Is that an issue for the U.S.? Should it indicate any any changes in policy from the U.S. towards Turkey? I don't expect a change. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, I expected a change from the Obama administration, mm -hmm. which I saw a much more idealistic uh, administration uh, than than Trump, but. It, it, Trump, I mean, he was very clear on that. I don't think he, he'll work with his allies uh, on U.S. national security interests. But other than that, I don't think that he will be interfering in domestic uh, affairs of, of his allies. So I don't see a reaction coming out of, and 
besides he just con called Erdogan and congratulated him. Mm -hmm. So as long as his, uh, Trump's uh, uh, priority remains defeating ISIS, Turkey will remain an important partner. Uh, and, and I think the U.S. will keep working with, with Turkey on that. And uh, Trump won't mind whatever uh, is going on mm -hmm. in Turkey domestically. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, you. Gunil. Uh, this has been a vantage point from MEI with Dr. Gunil Tol, the head of the Center for Turkish Studies at MEI. Thank you for being with us and see you next time.